Africa. Uh, so the second um, seminar of the virtual seminar series of the Hellenic Society is uh, from Michaela Filiu, who is an assistant professor at the University of, of Ioannina. Um, and her the title of her talk is Stress, Anxiety, and the Brain, Mind the, the Mitochondria. Um, so Michaela is uh, at the University of Ioannina, the Department of Biological Applications and Technology, and she's also a collaborating researcher at the Department of Biomedical Research of uh, IMBP 4th, a branch of the uh, 4th, which is in Ioannina. Uh, she got her bachelor's degree at the University of Ioannina from the same department. Uh, she got her master's degree in molecular genetics from Imperial College and uh, her PhD from uh, Ludwig Maximilian University, where she worked with Chris Turk. And uh, following that, she did a postdoctoral uh, fellowship with uh, Chris Turk and after that with uh, Alan Chen at Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry. And she has also been a visiting researcher of uh, Harvard Medical School. So we're very happy to hear Michaela's work here in Greece. And so I will stop sharing so that I can let her share her screen. OK, can you all see the full screen of mine? Yes. OK, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Kiki. And um, I thank very much the Hellenic Neuroscience Society for this opportunity. And I think it's also a nice initiative currently that we cannot meet so often uh, in person. So um, as you know, it's quite a stressful time to be now. And um, we are experiencing a lot of uh, stress. There is always a lot of stress in our lives and modern lifestyle has um, made things a bit more difficult. We have a lot of work-related stress. We have COVID stress. Uh, stress has no weight. And um, we all know that uh, stress is an aggravating factor for psychiatric disorders. Now, we have a lot of issues with uh, psychiatric disorders because we don't fully understand what's going on in the brain when something goes wrong. Um, we don't have uh, molecular biomarkers, which means that when somebody needs to diagnose a certain psychiatric disorder, um, the first means of doing so, it's an oral interview. So you have no uh, you know, blood test or anything that you can use to help you to uh, do a diagnosis and then say, okay, that would be the best treatment for this person. Um, as a consequence, we uh, don't have appropriate therapies. A lot of therapies work in a trial and error manner. There are a lot of people who do not respond to treatment. Uh, so it's a field that needs a lot of uh, work and a lot of help in order to find new therapies and understand better uh, what's going on. So what I would like to uh, discuss with you today um, is first of all, what tools uh, we use um, as a neuroscientist, what, what tools we have used in our work in order to find what's going on uh, in stress and uh, anxiety related pathologies. And then I would like to uh, show you um, parts of the work we did in the Max Planck and also what we are currently uh, doing at uh, the University of Yohan. So starting with the toolbox, a lot of us, uh, we work with mice. Mice is a good model organism. Um, it helps us a lot also in terms uh, of uh, investigating psychiatric phenotypes. What we know is that um, the fear and the anxiety circuits are relatively well preserved in mice and humans. So we have a series of uh, animal models that we can work with um, that are based on selective inbreeding, which means that we take a trait that is of interest and we breed uh, animals in several generations so as to bring down to the next generation the anxiety or the stress related or the whatever trait of interest we want. Uh, we have a, a whole series of uh, stressors that we can apply to animals that could be acute stress, could be chronic stress, could be stress at an early age, uh, could be in uterus stress and so on. 
And we have the whole uh, umbrella of uh, pharmacological interventions. We can treat mice uh, acutely with injections, or we can treat mice chronically uh, through a regimen um, in their drinking water, for instance. So we use in the lab different mouse strains. Uh, there are several, let's say, families of mice. And uh, what we observed in a very recent study of us uh, was that um, different mouse strains differ in general. I mean, we uh, here use as an example black six mice and TBA mice. These are uh, mouse strains that we commonly use uh, in neuroscience. And we know that they have different behaviors in terms of their anxiety and depression like uh, phenotypes. Uh, however, when we went to uh, compare them at the metabolome level in their brain or in their plasma, we found out that basically these mouse strains are very, very different uh, with each other. What um, is the take home message from this? Uh, it is that we should really address mouse models in a holistic manner because there are differences that are involved that uh, you know, may not be seen by us if we uh, go in a targeted manner to investigate uh, something of interest, but there could be any sort of differences in the metabolism in other systems that may affect the phenotype that we actually see. And this is where the holistic approaches come. Uh, we have the luxury nowadays to have technologies uh, that address in a holistic manner genes, transcript, proteins, metabolites, and by integrating information from all these different systems, we can build and characterize well a given disease phenotype. We are most interested in the last two parts of this, uh, um, let's say, scale of different omics. So we are interested uh, in proteomics and apolomics. And, um, Going uh, in an omics manner or in a data-driven manner, it's helpful because uh, it's unbiased, so we don't know what we are looking for, so we are open to uh, where the data will guide us. Um, these technologies that we use are high throughput, are highly quantitative, so at the end we can identify with high accuracy uh, altered pathways, and we can then go back in the lab and check these altered pathways follow up this data in order to pinpoint potential candidate biomarkers or profiles that are related to uh, our disease of interest. Um, in terms of technology a bit, what we have done um, at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in order to investigate in a very highly accurate manner uh, two different conditions was to uh, feed mice with the uh, heavy nitrogen isotope. So these are stable isotopes, which means that they are not radioactive, so they are not harmful. And in nature, we mostly have a nitrogen isotope that has uh, seven neutrons and seven uh, protons. Uh, but we also have in very low levels uh, a heavy nitrogen, which has one more neutron, so it's still a nitrogen, but it's heavier. What we do with that, uh, we feed mice with food that has only this heavy nitrogen isotope. And then what does this mean? The mice, whatever proteins they produce, these proteins have the heavy nitrogen isotope instead of the uh, light one. So all the proteins these mice produce are essentially heavier. Why is this of interest to us? Uh, we can use these heavy labeled proteins and compare them with unlabeled proteins uh, in a, a mass spectrometer because mass spectrometer separates macromolecules based on their mass to charge ratio. So we use this information. We actually use mice that we have fed with a, a heavy nitrogen isotope as internal controls. And we compare them with the two groups we have of interest, like a mouse model of a certain disease and its control. Uh, we do this by comparing each group to the internal standard. This is a process that gives us very high accuracy. And at the end of the day, we can quantify in a very uh, high throughput manner what happens in our disease and in our control group at the protein level. However, we don't want only to focus on proteins. We want to focus on metabolites as well. So we collaborate with uh, different uh, 
partners. We do uh, with them either targeted or untargeted metabolomics. So we try to find changes uh, in metabolite levels. So we end up with lists of altered proteins, altered metabolites, and we integrate them in silico, trying to find pathways that are altered in a given situation. And then we follow up these pathway changes uh, to the lab, and we do all sorts of uh, biochemical and molecular assays in order to figure out what's really going on in a disease setting. So since we are working a lot with psychiatric disorders and we are interested in the brain, um, we have a specific uh, interest in synapses and we work with synaptosomes. So synaptosomes are artificially uh, isolated synapses. You can do that in the lab, take brain, and then uh, appropriately process it to get synaptosomes. Synaptosomes look like spheres that inside uh, they have uh, neurotransmitters. And uh, we can analyze this, we can see this in the microscope, and we can analyze this uh, artificially isolated synapses to see what they have inside. And by doing a protein profile, a proton profile of synaptosomes uh, in a mouse brain, we could see that these synaptosomes contain up to 3,000 proteins. So it's a nice system to study what's going on in synaptic dysfunction. So this is basically our toolbox. And uh, uh, throughout the years, we have investigated different mice and different uh, conditions with this toolbox, so multi-omics approaches, synapses, to try to find out what's going on. And what we actually saw uh, was that uh, in several cases that are related to stress or to antidepressant treatment or to high anxiety, uh, by using uh, this toolbox that we have, one way or another, we always came up uh, with mitochondrial changes. We saw mitochondrial changes in mitochondrial protein expression. We found out differences in mitochondrial number or in mitochondrial shape or in mitochondrial protein turnover. And I would like to give you an idea of how we uh, address these changes uh, by focusing on uh, two examples of the studies. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, antidepressant treatment. So uh, for this, we had a collaboration with uh, Harvard Medical School. Um, they have a very, very sophisticated mass spectrometer. This mass spectrometer uh, does quantification on one hand, and on the other hand, does visualization of this. So basically you can imagine, it's like you have a slice of brain, and on the slice of brain, you get quantitative information on what's going on at the protein level. We use this technology in order to understand what goes on in the brain when brains are treated with paroxetine. Paroxetine is a common antidepressant, a uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So we gave mice paroxetine together with heavy nitrogen which works as a label in this technology. And we try to find out uh, what happens when mice get paroxetine. And we got very nice pictures, as you can see here. On the left, you can see uh, an image of a uh, mouse hippocampus. And the more red this image is, the more protein turnover we have upon paroxetine treatment. As you can see, in different hypocampal regions, we have different levels of altered protein turnover. And not only that, we also have different patterns within the cells. So we see that in different regions, the protein turnover increases in the nuclei versus to the cytoplasm. And the other regions, this happens vice versa. Uh, so we have this very nice information um, at a spatial level, which is really nice and gives very nice pictures. However, we do not know what's going on at the protein level. We do not know which proteins change. And for that, we coupled this analysis with a typical proteomics workflow, where we try to find out which proteins are involved in this other number that we see when we treat mice with paroxetine. And what we found here was that um, 
the proteins that are, appear to have an altered protein turnover are proteins that are involved in mitochondrial function and oxidative phosphorylation. So we could see in a way that mitochondria are involved in the response to the organism when the organism gets into depressants. That's the one example. And the second example comes uh, from uh, many years of work at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry. Um, there, a mouse model of high anxiety was established, and a lot of studies have, have been done to characterize this model. So these are mice that are bred selectively for many generations for high anxiety trait. Uh, this happens by testing an initial population of mice in the elevated plasmids. So mice that spend most time in the protected and closed uh, arms of the elevated plasmids, they are, you know, by nature kind of stressed or scared or afraid. And these were selectively bred for many generations and they gave rise to the high anxiety phenotype. Now mice that they were more relaxed and they were going up and down in the open arms of the elevated plasmids uh, were again selectively bred for many generations and they gave rise to the low anxiety phenotype. So we actually wanted to compare what is different in the synapses of high versus low anxiety mice. We did this again by focusing on synaptosomes and by doing proteomics. And there we found that uh, almost 100 mitochondrial proteins are higher expressed in high anxiety mice. And these proteins were practically involved in every single mitochondrial function. Uh, that could be oxidative phosphorylation, mitochondria import, mitochondrial transport. So it looks like mitochondria are somehow involved to high anxiety. This comes along with increased oxidative stress in high anxiety. And then this also um, comes when we also study uh, metabolites. Uh, in this uh, in silico pathway analysis figure, you can see in blue metabolites that are altered between high and low anxiety animals. And in yellow, you can see the pathways that these metabolites are involved in. And we see again that mitochondria functions appear to be altered also at the metabolite level. So this... Um, Mitochondria implication in several aspects of anxiety, stress, and relevant treatments um, it led us to think whether you can use mitochondria, we can use mitochondria as pharmacological targets. And of course, this is not uh, something we invented. Uh, mitochondria are attractive pharmacological targets for several pathologies. Uh, we have a lot of information from cancer. And we also recently published a study where we see common patterns between psychiatric disorders and brain tumors in the brain in terms of mitochondria metabolism. So we thought that it would be a good idea to uh, pharmacologically target mitochondria to see if we can achieve therapeutic uh, effects. What we did here, we collaborated with Mike Murphy from the MRC in England. And uh, he has, or he has generated a compound that goes selectively inside mitochondria and supports the endogenous function of oxidative phosphorylation. So basically you, you give mice a mitochondria targeted antioxidant. We saw that in high anxiety mice, we have a high oxidative stress. So we fed mice through drinking water uh, with this uh, compound, with MitoQ. And what we actually saw was that mice that received MitoQ, after several weeks of treatment, showed decreased anxiety. Uh, this is again assessed by uh, the ethological mechanisms that mice have. It is assessed in the dark light box. So mice that got MitoQ, prefer to spend more time in the open area of the dark light box compared to mice that did not receive this treatment and prefer to be in the protected dark area. So that was very interesting for us. And it's also interesting uh, if one wants to eventually move to clinical settings. MitoQ, it's uh, something that you can buy off the counter. You can order it online. It's also a cream to keep a good skin health. 
and has been given also to um, clinical studies in other contexts, in other diseases, along with the medication that these patients receive. Uh, so it has been given to humans for a very long time, no side effects. So it's something that is actually applicable to be given uh, to uh, clinical populations. So um, that was the work we, we, we did at the Max Planck, and we are now uh, following here in the lab in Yanana. And I would like at the second part to give you some, um, an overview of what we are currently doing. Uh, basically, we uh, want to better understand what mitochondria actually do in the context of stress and anxiety-related pathologies. So we uh, kindly ask ourselves how do different stressors or stress-related interventions affect mitochondria and vice versa. Uh, we are also interested to find molecular profiles or create molecular biosignatures that are characteristic for certain stress and anxiety related pathologies. And also eventually at the end, we want to assess and understand better whether mitochondria can be uh, interesting pharmacological targets and whether we can use them as therapeutic targets in these pathologies. So the way we address this, the first question, um, it has to do a lot with uh, interventions in mice. So, excuse me. So what we do here is that we work with mice. Uh, we have the chance to have here high anxiety mice also, uh, and normal anxiety or standard uh, strains of mice like CD1 and Black 6 And we do uh, ask, both in high anxiety backgrounds and in normal anxiety backgrounds, what's going on if we intervene, if we stress these mice? We implement different stressors. We do acute stress like restraint stress or for swim stress. Uh, we also uh, intervene in early developmental uh, stages. So we uh, investigate the effects of maternal separation at an early age. And we try to see how mitochondria are implicated in all of these different stressors and whether we observe distinct mitochondria profiles there. That's what we do, uh, let's say, in the bad side. In the good side, uh, what we try to see is stress relieving effects and how mitochondria are implicated in that aspect as well. So we use different uh, mitochondria targeted compounds and see if they have uh, a relieving effect on the phenotype. Uh, we investigate the effects of enriched environment prior to stress exposure and we investigate the role of mitochondria in this. And also we play with lifestyle. So we check what happens if we change the dietary habits or if we um, mess up a bit with the physical exercise. The way we do that uh, is by combining several uh, technologies that we have available. Uh, we have by now established uh, a series of behavioral tests that we assess anxiety-related, depression-like, sociability-related phenotypes. Then we uh, play with pharmacology uh, in terms of acute injections or chronic treatments. And we want uh, to understand what's going on with the mitochondria. So we do a lot of mitochondrial assays to check um, what happens to mitochondrial proteins or oxidative stress readouts or mitochondrial DNA number uh, and so on. And of course, we use omics approaches to find out altered profiles at a high throughput level. So I just want to show you some um, data that we recently uh, got in our lab along these lines. Uh, this is an example of um, how we can investigate what happens in a, let's say, area that has not been of interest uh, a lot for anxiety and stress. So cerebellum normally in our minds is an area that is mostly related to motor coordination and that sort of activities. However, um, it has not been extensively uh, investigated in stress. So we thought, let's see what might go uh, on in the cerebellum after stress. 
So um, Mariangel and Marcus in our lab, and they exposed mice to an acute stress uh, by a forced swim stress. And then we collaborated with the University of Athens and Professor Vangelis uh, Gikas and Dr. Katerina Eliou. And uh, we performed a metabolomics analysis in the cerebellum. And what is very interesting there is that a single acute stressor for six minutes can generate persistent changes after two hours in the mitochondria cerebellum, sorry, in the, in the cerebellum metabolism. As you can see here, we have a very distinct pattern between the stressed and the unstressed mice. And we can also observe several changes in basic metabolic pathways just by a single acute stress exposure in the survey. Also, as we discussed, we are interested in um, finding new ways of maybe relieving stress effects through mitochondria. And we collaborate also with the University of Athens and synthetic chemists are collaborators. They can generate uh, substances that based on our data go specifically inside mitochondria and target the mitochondria changes that we have observed. So what we do then, uh, we investigate these substances. So we characterize them in vitro to see their uh, dosage levels, toxicity. We basically validate that they do have the molecular effects that they, we want them to have. And then we move into uh, the mouse world. So we administer them to mice. We check that everything goes well. And uh, we check the effects on the behavior and, of course, uh, on the molecular level. So Chris in our lab uh, is actually investigating the effects of a mitochondria targeted hydroxytyrosol. And that was generated by uh, assistant professor Yanis Kostakis at the University of Athens. So she feeds cells with um, this mitochondria targeted hydroxytyrosol. And what she had seen, and it's quite of interest, is that the mitochondria targeted hydroxytyrosol has antiproliferative effects when it's given in um, highly proliferating cells, which could be, of course, of interest if one uh, wants to target cancer related properties. We also see that uh, hydroxytyrosol that specifically goes into the mitochondria uh, has um, defined antioxidant effects as we expect it to be. And after characterizing this in vitro, we move in vivo. So we have given uh, this mitochondria targeted hydroxytyrosol in mice. Uh, in both sexes, we see that everything goes fine. Everything has gone fine so far. Mice drink normally. They are physiologically okay. And we have characterized the antioxidant effects of this compound now in vivo. And finally, of course, we are interested in identifying um, important things in humans as well. And so this is an example of a study we did um, to investigate what goes on in women that uh, suffer for uh, postpartum depression. So in collaboration with the University of Crete, we compared uh, CIRA from uh, postpartum depression diagnosed females, women that just gave birth, compared to controls uh, by uh, targeted metabolomics approach. And we could see there that again, we do observe changes even in the peripheral material uh, in these women compared to uh, control counterparts, which is, of course, very important if one wants to devise diagnostic methods for uh, future clinical applications. So with that, I would like to uh, sum up. And um, I hope I could show you a bit that uh, it's nice to use multiomics approaches and integrate findings from different technologies in order to identify networks that change in a disease setting, and at the same time to see things that are of interest to target. Um, I hope I could convince you a bit that mitochondria are regulating stress and anxiety related behaviors and responses, and that uh, targeting mitochondria may have a therapeutic potential, potential in these pathologies. And if you are interested about uh, anxiety and mitochondria, this is a recent review that we have published on this 
crosstalk in the brain of anxiety and mitochondria. And with that, I would like to thank uh, um, people that have contributed um, in the studies I've shown you. Uh, a lot of uh, the things I've showed you were uh, happened in Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry. I would like to thank Chris Turk, who is my PhD and postdoc advisor, Alon Yen, our collaborators uh, internationally, funding that we had uh, at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry, and then our collaborators uh, here in Greece, uh, funding uh, that we have now in our lab in Greece. And uh, these are the people from our lab, uh, Chrisa and Mariangela, our postdocs in our lab. Marcus is our research technician. Kostas Konidaris is our uh, edit member. And Alexandros and Mariangela are uh, diploma students. Uh, we have also a Facebook page if you want to find news about us. Uh, it's called the Biochemistry Lab Vet. If you want to join us there. And um, at the end, I would uh, like to thank very much uh, Theoni Draga, who is an emeritus uh, professor uh, at uh, VET. Thank you very much for everything. And uh, I would like to thank all of you for your patience, and I'm happy to discuss with you further. Thank you very much, Michaela, for your um, talk. So if uh, people have questions, they can raise their hand or they can write in the chat, whichever they prefer. Um, but I would like to start, the, if you don't mind, um, by asking you if you have noticed any differences between males and females, like basic levels in the metabolome. Uh, that's a very interesting question. We try to pursue this. Uh, we currently have projects that are running to do so. So um, at the moment, we are investigating sex differences in maternal separation and in enriched environments. So we always take into account in our experimental design both sexes. And uh, also, for instance, here in the TPPHT experiment, we also just to, to see if you know the thing works. Uh, we also did this in both sexes, so we do take this into account in our experimental design, uh, of course, because it's it's very interesting. And also, we know, I guess, Christina also can tell us much better that. that um, in this stress-related, anxiety-related uh, phenotypes, females seem to be a bit more or much more sensitive compared to males. So it's, of course, very interesting to do this in a sex-dependent matter manner and also compare the effects between males and females. But I was also wondering more about the basal levels. Like, are there any differences, striking differences between the metabolism between males and females in neurons? So for example, uh, like the, the slice experiment that you did in Harvard, which is very nice. Um, so are there, you know, are females have increased metabolism or anyways, different metabolism? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, there we may only had a very limited number of males because it was a very time consuming work to generate these figures. So there we could not expand on uh, addressing also sex differences. Okay. Can I say something on this? Because we had a study with Michaela, which is not published yet for various reasons, but uh, we had some basal uh, difference there on, uh, in the hippocampus yes. for the metabolomics between males and females. Of course, then we were also interested in uh, Aromatase inhibition and uh, other factors, but there were some. Yeah, basal and, I mean, they are very impressive uh, compared to, let's say, uh, you know, like a treatment versus a control. The sex dependent differences, they are very impressive in terms of fall changes and the amount of metabolites that change. It's, it's very nice to see. <laughs> okay. Yes. So, uh... Christina, do you have a I, I, I have a quick question. Yes, I just want to say congratulations. It's very interesting to see the continuation of all this work. And I was wondering why you chose to study the cerebellum in the study with uh, 
omics with uh, Vagelis Gikas? So, you know, I mean, we, we have practical limitations, right? So we can take certain regions. I mean, it would be, of course, nice to investigate the amygdala, for instance, but for the work we do, several regions are not um, allowing us to study them because they are very, very small in terms of starting amount. And um, cerebellum, I mean, it has always been there. We always collect it. And we thought, okay, what shall we do with the cerebellum? Then we looked a bit in the literature and we found out that it's practically very few things addressing cerebellum and stress. I mean, we could come up with a review practically of two years ago that summarized everything. It was very rare to find studies that would address cerebellum with stress. So we thought, okay, let's let's give it a shot. I mean, it could show something or it could not show anything. And it was, we were also surprised because the, the signatures, first of all, are very, very distinct, like in terms of statistics. And second, the pathways that are changing are the pathways that you know, we do see in other regions that we are knowing in advance they are implicated in emotional processing. So we see changes, you know, in neurotransmitter metabolism. It's, it's a very similar pattern to what you would see, for instance, in the hippocampus, which is quite interesting because nobody would ex have expected this based on what we know. Yes, thank you. That's true. It's very interesting. Uh, I, I think Rodira has a question. Hi, Dr. Pillu, thank you very much for the interesting talk. Actually, it's a continuation of Professor Dalla's question. I am very interested in this phenotype, distinct phenotype you have in the cerebellum. We actually did a very big RNA sequencing study here. We included the cerebellum because I punched it. <laughs> um, we have exactly what you're saying. A very, we have a very distinct mitochondrial impact of glucocorticoids on it. Uh, with many pathways that resemble the hippocampus and the amygdala response. And I was very interested in that. And I wanted to ask, since you are an expert on mitochondria, do you know if cerebellum is interesting? Is it known if cerebellum is interesting in any way specifically on mitochondria? Because we get a very specific, very specific enrichment on mitochondrial structures only in the cerebellum. Okay. I mean, what I could, uh, because, you know, cerebellum is also something that we now started to be interested in. It's not something we knew a lot of things before. So from, from what we've seen, um, I would assume that because cerebellum is involved in a lot of motor related concepts, uh, that maybe mitochondria just in, in the sense of pure metabolism, pure energy requirements, would be involved just, just in terms of what function uh, the, met the cerebellum does. The other thing that we saw in the literature was that somehow cerebellum talks with PFC. And uh, in PFC, we have documented mitochondrial changes. So that would be the two ideas I would use to maybe relate these findings that you mentioned. Thank you very much. I might contact you later. <laughs> okay. Vasiliki uh, Panagiotokopoulou, if I did. Yeah, yeah, correct. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. So I was wondering whether there is any known cell type specific of a role of mitochondria in this regarding stress? That's a painful story. <laughs> um, so the omic studies I've shown you, we do it in synaptosomes. So synaptosomes have only neural cells, uh, which is good because then you don't have the glia story, which you can exclude by investigating synaptosomes. Now, I'm sure that uh, people who are more into this, they would say, but you know, what type of synapses do you have there? There are different types of synapses. With this bulk molecular uh, work, we cannot differentiate. So we say that this is neural um, tissue, so to say, and does not include all sort of, you know, microglia, astrocytes, and so on. There have been studies now that try to address mitochondria in a cell type dependent manner, uh, but mostly this uh, has to do with separating neurons and glia. 
I don't think we are that far to, you know, go to excitatory or inhibitory uh, differentiations and so on. But of course, it's it's very very relevant to know where these energy dependent changes come from. Thank you, uh, Pano. Uh, thank you, uh, Michaela. Thank you very much uh, for this great uh, talk and. Um, uh, well, presenting thank us you for all the invitation. <laughs> yes, for all these nice tools and approaches and results. Um, I, I, I was, um, I, I'd, I'd like a lot uh, your uh, spatial uh, approach with this nitrogen um, isotopes. Uh, of course, all other methodologies are great, but uh, can you? I was wondering whether if you have this data. Can you and you observe differences in mitochondrial proteins? For, uh, yes, mitochondrial proteins. Can you discriminate uh, between uh, bi mitochondrial biogenesis or mitochondrial uh, specific gene expression differences? Or um, because you, you, we know that there are many different mitochondria per cell and. Uh, or, or, or this is a, a general outcome that you just uh, take into account? This is a very, very valid point, and uh, we are going a bit into that now. So if you do omics and uh, you, know, you use like databases and so on, there is always a bias towards very well characterized pathways. So things like oxidative phosphorylation, Krebs cycle, um, mm -hmm. you know, lipid um, making and demaking, you know, all of these are very well characterized. So chances are that they will always come up with a good score in your in silico studies. Things like, uh, I'm giving a random example, like autophagy, which are kind of new and they are not very well characterized, have limited chances to come up with a good score just because of the making of the whole in silico work. Uh, so it's much easier when you do an omic study to find changes in oxidative phosphorylation than having a pathway that says mitochondria biogenesis coming up. Uh, however, exactly because of the mitochondria heterogeneity, uh, as you mentioned that we have different DNA copy numbers, different mitochondria numbers in cells and so on, we are much more, uh, we are actually interested in that as well. So what we try to do now in several stress interventions is that we try to see what's going on uh, in the mitochondrial fusion and fission by in a targeted mm. manner looking at the proteins that regulate these structures yeah that's that would be very interesting yes yeah thank you very much thank you thanks uh, You're muted. Maybe you can turn on the microphone. Well, I don't hear her. <laughs> um, does anyone else have a question for Michaela? Okay. Ah, cool. Yes. Okay. Can you hear her, Michaela? No. No. All right. Okay. Does anyone else have a question for Michaela? You can speak up if you want. Mm -hmm. Ah, now you, we can oh, hear. No. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting, Dr. Filiu. Um, my question is very similar to uh, the one Panagiotis uh, was setting before. Does uh, um, anxiety or whatever you have looked for um, hmm. affected um, mitophagy or esophagy of uh, mitochondria? and uh, their turnover, uh, but you have all, already answered this question, I guess, 
or you want to add something on that? Well, um, yeah, a bit towards flow in a different direction, adding to um, mm. what we just said before. Um, what I think based on the data we gather uh, is also quite interesting besides the, um, you know, the mitochondrial number or, you know, the fission and fusion of mitochondria. I think it's also very interesting um, the profile of mitochondria. So in addition to all these changes, we see consistently, I would say, in several project changes in mitochondrial transporters. And some of them, you know, they transport stuff like glutamate inside mitochondria. So I, I think it would be nice to follow up this profile. Like, okay, we have mitochondria, they may have or may not have changes, but there are things that go in and out of the mitochondria that may differ as well. And they may also be relevant to the phenotype we are studying. Like if you have a neurotransmitter, you know, changing wow. amounts in an, inside a, an organelle, that can be very relevant to uh, synaptic dysfunction that you might see. Mm -hmm. okay. So just to another direction as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Adoni. Yeah, uh, a rather general question actually. I guess uh, a lot of people would like to ask this question. Uh, what's the initiating event? Uh, you stress an animal, you stress a human, and then you get a phenotype in their mitochondria. How on earth are those two events related? I know it's a one million dollar question. It's very nice because all the questions you've asked me so far, I think it could be reviewer questions. So yes. We're doing a lot of training here. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Particular for the mitochondria, I think there is um, this sort of notion of uh, the chicken and the egg, you know, uh, because we typically know mitochondria for oxidative stress. Oxidative stress in several studies comes up and then, you know, there is a link between uh, phenotype and oxidative stress, but, you know, you have to show somehow that this is causal and not a consequence. Um, so this discussion applies also to mitochondria. Um, what I would say is relevant here, uh, it has to do also with the mitochondria positioning or the mitochondrial number in a certain uh, area. We had done a study with uh, Yanis Sotiropoulos a few years ago. So what it was found was that the mitochondrial number changes at the synapses upon stress, which means that, you know, if you have a stress event, I'm just doing a hypothesis, okay? Um, you have a stress effect and then this requires energy and then you recruit mitochondria from a place A to a place B. And this at the place B, which is a synapse, let's say, may completely change the energy profile. At the same time, we know that mitochondria at the synapses, they are uh, used as calcium storage places. They, they relate to apoptosis. So you can have all this uh, turnover or regulatory additional mechanisms beside energy. So I would think more that the one could see it as a system that is dynamic and moves around, not necessarily you know, being generated more or so, Mm -hmm. But being a versatile tool of the organism to reply and address stressful events. Okay, in that sense, I guess you should incorporate studies in glial cells as well. Of course, of course. Otherwise, and you get then, half the picture. Of course, of course. I mean, we are limited when we do a lot of molecular stuff. We are very yeah. limited in terms of starting material. Yeah, so, yeah, I guess. Uh, and a, a very quick technical question. Uh, on your study with the cerebellum, what type of stress uh, have you applied? So we did a, a six-minute FST. FST, okay. Uh, and you had males or females? We only had males in this study. Males. Uh, so you had controls not exposed to FST and okay. FST exposed. Yeah, you've got that confounding factor, the movement. Uh, you mean the, uh, the, the swim, I mean the swimming per se. 
uh, that could confound your results because you've got a control not moving or moving slightly and uh, an animal actually struggling in the water. And the controls had no FST. They just yeah. stayed. Okay. And we consider this FST not only as a psychological stressor, we consider this as a stressor overall, also a movement stressor. Like yeah, but, uh, but you have a, an area involved in movement, the cerebellum, mm -hmm. and you have to differentiate movement from stress per se, and that's really tricky. We, what we tried to do there, uh, exactly to address all of this, was uh, we, we left them two hours to uh, recover. And then we took the, um, the cerebellum so as to avoid, you know, these acute effects of the test overall. That, as you yeah. say, of course, they contain several factors. Uh, I, yeah, it's a long question, a well, long story we would uh, open here, but uh, just think about doing the same type of experiments in your neonatal experience model. You mean to do it earlier? Uh, I mean, uh, and see what happens there. Okay. Because you can control much better. And if you do it at the correct point, they don't move a lot. If you do it okay. at P10, they don't move. So you don't have movement. And cerebellum is there. Mm -hmm. It's not fully mature, but it's, it's there. Okay. Thanks for that. Yes, we will try this. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Thank you. Okay, so if, uh, I don't know, is there any more questions? Are there any more questions for Michaela? So in that case, I would like to thank Michaela for her exciting talk and everybody for the discussion. And uh, we can see each other again here in about a month. I think it will be April 1st, so it will be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here.